Thank you. Um, just on, I, I, I decided to choose today a, a, a relatively minor topic, just by way of showing um, what can be <coughs> what can be known about the Billingshausen expedition um, and how that sort of work can be conducted. Um, on these larger questions uh, that have been aired before I spoke, I mentioned that I have an article forthcoming in Polar Record which offers uh, fresh translations of the key passages in Bellingshausen's book um, uh, about this, the approaches of, the, of late January and uh, mid-February 1820. And also, very importantly, his theoretical discussion towards the end of the book, in which um, I have to mention to the previous speaker, uh, Bellingshausen shows very clearly that he was, he was thinking about and possibly expecting to see an ice continent, uh, and uh, probably heavily influenced by the ideas of the French nat naturalist Buffon, who had supposed that such a continent would exist and would occupy most of the space south of 70 degrees. Anyway, just to, to get back to what I'm talking about, um, right, we use the arrows for this, do we? Okay, let's try that. In the last paragraph of his book, um, Two Seasons of Exploration in the Southern Ice Ocean, Bellingshausen summed up the achievements of the expedition by saying that they had discovered 29 islands, two in the Antarctic, eight in the southern temperate zone, or what we might now call sub-Antarctic, and 19 in the tropics. The first thing that stands out from that tally is that by October 1824, when he finished writing the book, Bellingshausen had decided to reclassify what he had earlier called the Alexander I coast, discovered on the 28th of January 1820, as an island. He was not the first member of the expedition to do so, because Mikhail Lazarev, who commanded the second ship, Mirmi, also called it an island in a letter which he wrote uh, at the end of 1824, uh, 18, sorry, 1821. The modern name, of course, is Alexander Island. So which islands made up uh, Cook's, um, Bellingshausen's total? Well, sorry, press the wrong thing. I hope that's more visible up there than it is down here. <laughs> we can get a fairly good idea of how Bellingshausen arrived at his numbers. The key document is his final table of discoveries, which was discovered by Mikhail Belos's colleague, B.V. Kuznetsova, more than 50 years ago, but which she never analyzed herself. Nor has any other Soviet or Russian historian done, done so, because for the past 50 years, there has been very little interest in Russia in actually studying the expedition. Uh, you won't be able to see, oh yes, you can see that a lot better than I can. <laughs> um, <coughs> Neither Bellingshausen's final report nor the table of measurements of 50 islands, which he added as an appendix to that report, has ever been published in, in Russia. They are hardly known there. I translated and published them in my 2014 book. The two Antarctic islands were obviously Peter I and uh, Alexander I coast, as, as he listed them, as he listed it in, the, in this table, which was eight, dating 1821. Um, the first three temperate or sub-Antarctic islands were, of course, the Traversé group in the South Sandwich Islands, discovered in the end of 1819. But were the Russians the first people to see them? According to a shipboard diary kept by the expedition's astronomer Simonov, before discovering the traverses, Bellingshausen received information about the volcanic South Sandwich Islands from the Russian sealer, mentioned by Bob, serving on the British ship in South Georgia, at South Georgia. Whether that included something about the traverse group is not known. Oops, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> it's hard to see these arrows. Um, some for, uh, foreknowledge is suggested by Bellingshausen's uh, chart of his voyage. You can see 
he heads off confidently from South Georgia and the Clark Rocks, in a, pretty much in the, in the direction <coughs> of the Sandwich Islands, which Pace, Pace Bob are shown clearly as two islands on his chart, not one. Uh, but he's heading for Candlemas. Um, this little loop in the middle is because there was a, a, a mistaken sighting of possible land. The, the expedition were, of course, complete novices on Antarctic ice at the time. And uh, the report came from many. Someone on Vostok thought they agreed, and that's what they were doing with that little muddle there. Um, anyway, during the night of uh, 3rd of January, 1820, the ships were hove to in a west north -est west wind. When visibility cleared, they did not resume their course to Candlemas, which you can see, but turned uh, east-northeast, um, uh, and then sighted Leskov. I don't have a pointer, this is very difficult. Um, Leskov is the little, is that little dot there. So having sighted it, they, they then bore more or less north. Passing Leskov, they then headed uh, northeast by north, pretty much directly towards Zabodovsky. Um, but uh, then they gave up turned due south, and, and, and then suddenly there was another rethink, and he turned back northwest here, uh, having um, sights um, uh, Visakoi, which was originally Torsen, then seeing heavy cloud up further north, and keep going. But this time, gets to, gets to Zavodovsky, sends boats in, and people have a pretty good uh, exploration of that island, the first people to see it, or, or certainly probably to land there, though one thing that distinguishes it from Leskov and Visakoi is that there are, there are colonies of penguins there. I'm not sure about seals. Uh, Bob would know that sort of thing. Not very many. Difficult for them to land. No, right. It was difficult to land. I think they mentioned that. There, are, yeah. there was quite a, quite a, quite a steep sh a cliff to get up. Um, oh, terrific. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just that. Yeah, no, no, there. Above us, there. <coughs> like that. There was a pointer, yes. So thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's... it's uh, uh, can I see it? That's pointing. There we are. Okay, thanks. Now I've got it. Um, <coughs> so it's... Um, the curious decisions are these alterations of course here, when he's sort of more or less heading for Candlemas, but shifts, and then shifts again, and finds, so it looks, it looks rather as if he's looking for something which he had some idea, perhaps, from Prusak, which means cockroach, the sealer, and that there were some islands, north or north, North uh, west or non or west of, of Candlemas. Um, we can't tell, of course. And in any case, if we mean by discovery, first discovery by Europeans, not only seeing it but also recording it, sealers, as is well known, are very shy of, of, of publishing their, their knowledge. And Bellingshausen <coughs> is definitely the first person, uh, first commander to record the Candlemas, the, 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 the Traverse Islands. What about his other South and uh, um, sub-Antarctic discoveries? Um, as you can see on the left-hand column, he puts letters against uh, most of these South Shetlands. Um, in fact, all of them. Uh, and, uh, but nevertheless, he doesn't claim that number in his final tally. Uh, what he seems to claim are the Elephant and Clarence group, which is at the bottom of the list, and, that, and they would include the, uh, uh, what O'Brien, which has got actually got O'Brien, Aspen, and Levy, <coughs> um, and Gibbs, Elephant, Cornwallis, and Clarence. Well, that's too many. Um, 
to, because if you add that to his three traverse irons, you get more. You get more mates. You get um, whatever it is. <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, it's ten, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, the, the suggestion I it would should should be that by 1824, when he's finishing his book, uh, he he would have known by then that that um, it was known that these were islands that they were not a part of a larger land mass. This is a this is an American school atlas published in 1823, where you can where they, it's perfectly clear that these are islands. And there may be something here, marked here as Palmer's land, which is more substantial. But he's not very good on sa the Sandwich Islands, <laughs> which is still calling Sandwich Land. So this is uh, published by a publisher called Woodbridge in the United States. And you can see why Bellingshausen, instead of producing, giving himself um, seven place names places from, from the elephant and Clarence group gives himself five because he's simply treating uh, uh, O'Brien, Aston and Edie as a single place which is given one name, the three brothers. But he does have a right to claim that uh, which he called Rojnov Island or Rajnov in the old imperial spelling and which is now known as Gibbs um, because if you look at um, the map produced by uh, Bransfield uh, uh, after his survey, there's a very interesting sort of cloud bank there, but he's not claiming it as an island uh, next to the O'Briens, which he was the first to name. Um, so I think Bellingshausen is entitled to Gibbs, uh, myself. Um, so there we are, that's, that's how he got to that total of eight um, sub-Antarctic islands, eight, five for the Elephant and Clarence group, which he did not know had already been seen and mapped. And in, in the case of Seal Island, there was a landing. I think there was another landing, wasn't there, Bob? Yes. Yes, or was it on Clarence? Uh, elephant, on the south uh, east. Right. So anyway, Bransfield and Smith are pretty well well dealt with the elephant and clients, except for that Gibbs Island question mark. Um, as uh, the, the reef or shoal, which is on that list of, of Bellingshausen's, is, is a mystery, because where he, put, where he puts it is a long way off his track, and it's not at all clear how, he's, how, he's, how he cited it. So that brings him to a total of, of six uh, um, altogether, four sub-Antarctic, namely the Traverses and Gibbs, and, and of course Peter the First and Alexander. So the third number to look at is how many islands did he discover on the, in his, the tropical phase of his voyage, and these are most, most of the ones he, he put on his list. Um, as you can see, he didn't, uh, he didn't put numbers against all of them, um, uh, he, he left out uh, Alparo at the top there, Rafa, and uh, at the bottom, uh, Matea, Ma which is now called Makatea, and Kuzenstern, Tikahu. Um, he didn't number those, he knew they had been discovered earlier, but he, that still leaves him with 21 uh, on his numbered list or possibly, 20, uh, sorry, 22, and to get it down to 19, he has to leave out three more. And it's pretty obvious he would have left out Henry, which wasn't in fact Henry, but he, the word Henry is on his list, in, you know, not, it's not put there by me. Um, so that, that was one candidate for a mission. Um, one, one of them is simply marked a to Poto there, and that's probably because he didn't probably think he had good enough measurements of it uh, to amount to a, a proper discovery and rec recording of an island. Um, so he had to leave out three others, or well, Henry probably, um, which he mistook for Nengo Nengo, 
but it was actually Wallace's Cumberland Island. Now, as early as 1831, <coughs> the British explorer Frederick Beechey said that Bellingshausen's mistake had been caused by measuring Cumberland more accurately than Wallace had done and gave, giving it Wallace's position for Nengo Nengo. Uh, Bellingshausen may have taken the original account of Wallace's voyage with him because it had three other voyages with it in the same book, but he's e equally or more likely to have taken some sort of compendium or navigational, uh, 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 <coughs> navigational information. And there were two likely ones. One is Tucky's Maritime Geography, 1815. Another one is Purdy's Oriental Tables. This is the, pa a pa the relevant page from Tucky, and in fact, Tucky has given positions for Cumberland <coughs> Island, which are a lot closer to Bellingshausen's so-called Henry Island. So that suggests Bellingshausen didn't have this with him. But we don't know what he had. All we do know is he had a, a, a rather large sum of money from, from the Emperor Alexander to spend in Britain. Uh, and I think it would be interesting to check that up sometime. It's exactly what was transferred to the Bank of England. Uh, and whether, we don't even know whether Bellingshausen, whether the Russians paid for the extensive modifications of the ships in Portsmouth while they spent a month shopping in London uh, at bookshops, instrument makers, and so forth. Anyway, another possible omission from that list. Let me think if I can get it back. No, I don't get it back, sorry. <coughs> is, uh, is uh, oh no at the bottom here, which is actually uh, uh, an atoll with about six or seven islands in it, six islands, which had been previously discovered by people searching for the Bounty Mutineers. Um, we don't know what on earth the third island was, but somehow Bellingshausen got his list of Pacific discoveries down to 19. Now, using previous investigation by Glyn Barrett, who is the great historian of Russians in the Pacific, we can see which islands Bellingshausen was actually the first to discover uh, in the sense of first European sighting and recording. And they were by no means all the ones on his list of 19. Um, from Howe, which had been first sighted in 1606 by Kerosh, the Portuguese navigator working for the Spanish. And then the <coughs> last one was probably Macamo, I'm not sure it's on this list, um, which had been cited by, <coughs> Be uh, by Byers in 1803. So on that, uh, when you go through that investigation and other listings, uh, you can see that only 11 of his islands were in fact new discoveries and those are the ones I've underlined in green. Um, so that brings his total up to, up to 17, if I'm getting it right. Uh, let me think. Yes, that's right. So the Russians were the first to see the two famous discoveries, first land south of the Antarctic Circle, the, the four sub-Antarctic, and 11 tropical, uh, which are named there. So 17 rather than 29. <coughs> but this, this is a strange tradition. Uh, in the 19th century, nobody paid an awful lot of attention to this, this question. But uh, in 1903, Viktor Rusakov, whose real name was uh, Libravich, Sigismund Libravich, published a very fulsome and misleading account of the expedition in which he even made the whole 29 islands of Bellingshausen's last paragraph sound as if they must be Antarctic because he wrote, and I quote, Bellingshausen crossed the Antarctic circle three times and discovered in all 29 islands. No reference to the Pacific phase of the voyage in this book. So it sounds as if he's gone around the, the Antarctic discovering a lot of islands. Um, the, the interesting thing about the book, though, is that it's still in print. It was republished in facsimile in 1996, and it's been kept in print in Russia ever since. So despite Barrett's analysis and my own attempt 
in 2014, authoritative information sources in Russia continued to accept Bellingshausen's original estimate of 29 discoveries. Presumably they do so because 29 is a larger number than 17, and they fail to realize that false boasting is actually bad for prestige. But sheer ignorance is probably also part of the explanation. Typical reference guides <coughs> include this, uh, which is a 700-page volume for the 18th and 19th century in a large school encyclopedia published in 2002. And um, this, uh, which is uh, Who's Who in the World, published in 2003, and the first volume of A History and Culture of Russia, a six-volume authoritative reference work published in 17, 2017. I don't have a slide of that. Proliferation of the fake fact that Bellingshausen discovered 29 islands is widespread on the internet and endorsed by heavyweights like the Meteorological Service, the Indrometsenta Rassi, in 2015, and the Presidential Library in 2018. None of this is really Bellingshausen's fault. He was not a historian of geography, but a hard-working and proficient naval officer with a limited command of English. Perhaps he should have consulted some of the standard lists of discoveries, like the ones I mentioned, more carefully, but we don't know what books he bought. Um, nor is it really the fault of mon modern Russian authors who continue to wheel out Bellingshausen's original estimate that he discovered 29 islands. When it comes to Bellingshausen, Russians have a long-standing habit of not asking questions. The situation is almost as bad in English, though on the internet most of that is down to Russian authors. In Russia, at least, it is the historians who are mainly responsible for the problem. No one has published any serious and substantial work on Bellingshausen's expedition since the last article by Bielov and Kuznetsova in 1974. Apart, that is, from Aristotle's scholarly edition in 1990 of an unfinished account of the voyage by Simonov, in which neither Aristotle nor Saint Simonov shed much light on the subject. <coughs> as long as historians choose not to study the Bellingshausen expedition, powerfully supported Soviet myths will continue to proliferate from the alleged Russian discovery on of Antarctica on the 28th of January 1820, which never happened, I think, and uh, to the claim that James Clark Ross had recognized that achievement, a fabrication first published in 1972 without a shred of evidence. Are Russian historians reluctant to re-examine in the expedition out of patriotic deference to Soviet myths which would not survive a thorough scrutiny? Who can say? The question of the number of islands discovered is just a small example of this regrettable situation, one in which people prefer to sit on their mental backsides telling one another fairy stories about the past instead of actually getting down to the hard work of studying it. What I tried to demonstrate in miniature this afternoon is that it is possible and desirable to ask intelligent questions about the expedition and sometimes also to answer them. Mistakes get made, certainly, but over time we can make progress with establishing the facts, with understanding them, and also with understanding not only our own mistakes, but those of far too many previous historians, most, but not all of them, Russians. Thank you. <coughs>